Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence along with our cast of experts as we're all set to go against the spread this weekend's college and pro football cards. And all I can say, guys, is we are back. It's been quite a hectic two weeks for us down here in Florida. Also for our producer, Greg, up in North Carolina. He was in Asheville where Hurricane Helene knocked on his door. Then it came knocking on the door down here, Hurricane Milton. And it's been all sorts of chaos since then. It's just unbelievable how this has touched every facet of our businesses, but we're glad to be back here. Andy, no hurricanes for you in Las Vegas, I'm guessing. No, it was a little bit windy, but not quite uh, hurricane strength. And uh, what is, uh, I forget what rain looks like, but that's not a bad thing out here. We, we do have a drought. It's not as bad as it had been, but no, I, uh, my thoughts and prayers were with all the folks back in the eastern sea, on the eastern seaboard and uh, stretching down. Uh, I don't know if it reached as far as Victor, if you had any issues down the, uh, where you were, but uh, otherwise, uh, glad to see that. Hopefully, it's all over. Unfortunately, they say the calendar says the hurricane season ends November 1st, but Mother Nature does not know the calendar. No, Mother Nature does not know the calendar for sure. Seems like every time we got to the middle of October, we felt like we were skating home relatively free, and we got a left and we got a right these past two weeks. And uh, I'll be talking with Greg, introducing him in just a minute here, but he's the guy that really got socked. Jim Feist, Las Vegas. How's your football season going for you this year? Yeah. Well, the, the football season has been better than the hurricane season for you guys. That's yes. for sure. Um, uh, I can't complain. I did have a losing Sunday, uh, but not terrible. It just wasn't as good as Saturday, which was very good. But uh, then Greg comes on here today and he says, well, we're going to lose the West Coast to the earthquakes and the, you know and and then we say we're going to lose the east coast to the hurricanes so the only thing we're going to have left we determined would be kansas well let's click our heels and get to kansas i guess <laughs> that's what we need to do victor how did you withstand what was to be an imminent hurricane down here i know we did not get hit directly impacted a few uh i guess some tornadoes set down in the area but uh Really, I walk the neighborhood every morning, and I didn't see hardly any limbs or branches or trees anywhere. How was it your, in your neighborhood, Victor? Uh, same here in Sunrise. We got lucky, but you know what, guys? Uh, this was supposed to be a bye week for hurricanes, or at least it is for the Miami of Florida hurricanes yes. who are on their bye week. But I guess Mother Nature is not on her bye week this week. It seems like and we're right in the heart of the season, Mark. We're getting almost one a week with Helene last week and this guy Milton this week. And, and you're, you're right, right down, down here in southeast, southeast Florida, Florida. We, got we got virtually nothing. nothing. It, it looks, looks like, like the uh, southeast, southeast portion of the hurricane didn't do very much damage to us at all in southeast Florida. Of course, like you guys said, you know, prayers and wishes for everybody in the northern portion of Florida. But uh, overall, we're okay. We had a five and two weekend, a three and one in college football, two and one in the NFL, a Monday night easy winner on under the total. So uh, we're ready to go for this weekend. And by the way, as far as the Miami Hurricanes go, I think their defense had a bye the past two weeks. Oh, you got that right. That's what it appears to be, Andy. It's kind of like a problem looming there. Right. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. You know, we get to find out what category defense they have there. It's not very good right now. I do know that uh, the hurricane season is here when our granddaughter calls. She called Colleen, my wife, Grandma, and uh, every time a hurricane is knocking in the door, she wants to come running over to our house because she feels a lot safer here with us. So. That was the benefit, having her with us for the past couple of days. So uh, no no complaints here, none whatsoever from me, having our granddaughter here for a couple of weeks. That was real nice. Tony Mejia, you're up in Daytona area up there. And I know that hurricane was supposed to be knocking on your door. Did it make it there? And how did you make out? It hung out, it knocked on the door about 3 a.m. So I, I spent some time entertaining it, and then I went to bed. Fourth, <laughs> I was writing up a, a preview for Arizona State Utah's Friday night game that I wanted to make sure it got in because it was due this morning. So I said, all right, if I, if I lose power for a couple hours, cross my fingers on Thursday, I'll still get it back and be able to proceed normally. So no losing power for me, which is great. Got the preview in, watched a few other things, got the table ready for today. It's a huge day in sports. Got international soccer going on everywhere. WNBA finals kicking off. We've got college football, the NFL, the NBA preseason. So, I mean, there's, there's something. And don't forget the MLB playoffs. And obviously, yeah, MLB, ALDS, game four. So uh, watched the Yankees yesterday. 
come through, and uh, I believe they will come through again today. But yeah, absolutely, it's, uh, it's great that uh, Milton decided to spare me, but there is now another storm, I guess, that's supposed to hit no, no. this weekend it's developing. So yeah, no, uh, no reprieve from hurricane season just yet. Uh, but uh, you know, Greg, I guess that's the, the brunt of this, so uh, I will not uh, bitch too hard about uh, not losing power and being just slightly inconvenienced. <laughs> I was going to say we saved uh, the worst for last, and I mean that just facetiously with Greg, because he got absolutely pounded in Asheville, North Carolina, where it made headlines all across the country. And in fact, Greg got hit so hard, how hard did he get hit? He's in a new home right now, a new home, a new broadcast setup and everything. He got out of Dodge, if you will, just in time, and now we're back here two weeks later. And Greg, I can only say I'm glad that you and your mom are doing well these days. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, uh, we were very fortunate, actually. I can't imagine trying to go uh, house rent shopping after the storm. That would have been uh, 10 times, 100 times worse. So we, that's why I said, I mean, I, I look back at what happened and yes, it was an inconvenience. Yes, I never would wish this upon anybody as far as no electric and no internet. I mean, just, it's like you're back in the 1800s. You got to just use your head and think and twiddle your thumbs and that's it. There's nothing to do. So, well, some, some of us were actually born in the 1800s. That's true, Jim. Yeah, I, we could have a good conversation <laughs> about how, how that went. Jim, hold that to one, please. Okay. <laughs> so, I also want to pass along guys, if I may hear that, uh, two other, uh, Members of our playbook sports team uh, also live in Asheville, North Carolina. Charles Milstead and his wonderful wife, Kathy. Charles is the managing editor of our playbook publications, our weekly newsletter. Kathy is the statistician. She puts all the stats together from the midweeks and everything like that. They were also absolutely wiped out. It's one of the reasons that uh, the playbook newsletter was a little bit slow last week. In fact, it went out a day late, which was a miracle all into itself just given the fact that they got out of Dodge. I finally were able to get out of Asheville on Thursday and lo and behold, to their credit, they found a place to hunker down in Rock Springs, North Carolina. And he put the newsletter together that night. Just unbelievable. And by, and by the way, Mark, didn't stop the winners from coming. No, that was nice. Right, yeah. That was nice. yeah. That's the added bonus, Andy. <laughs> that was that was the center of the hurricane right there, the added bonus. And uh, so tip of the hat to Charles and Kathy, on a job well done over above and beyond uh, expectations and we were really glad to see that now as i speak with everybody i'm going to tell you about this week's playbook football newsletter and all the great things it's got inside of that but before i do that i want to remind you about this i'm going to tell you to go download the newsletter and get all these great stats and that's great and so forth and whatnot but as i'm speaking to you right now our playbook servers are down because our servers are in florida they're in ocala yeah. florida oh, of course they <laughs> and, are unbelievable just unbelievable no power there right now so these far-reaching yeah. effects are really really impacting uh, a lot of different us in a lot of different ways but uh, most importantly everybody's safe and everybody's healthy and that's what really really counts so just be patient with you with us for a little while longer till we can get power back up and we'll get our newsletters out to everybody just in time for the games this weekend when you do download that newsletter this week i'm going to tell you guys it's 17 pages this week just jam-packed there's an underdog college football that's in a role in which the underdog is 20 and five straight up and 21, three and one to the spread Boom. outlined in the card this week. There's also a coach in a role in which he's never lost the money this week. And he's an underdog. Also a coach in an underdog role that is 19 and four straight up. You go over to the NFL side of things where it's not that deep of an NFL football card, but you've also got a coach that's in an underdog role. In this underdog role as this dog, this coach is 14 and five straight up and 15 and four of the spread. You'll want to find out who all these guys are this week in this week's edition of the Playbook Football Newsletter at playbooksports.com. So if you can't get in there, just keep knocking at the door. The door will be opening soon here. As soon as uh, everything, everybody upstairs says it's time to come on in and download your football newsletter, you can do that at playbooksports.com. With that, guys, before we get over to our college and pro football games of the week, uh, I want to run this by some uh, some of our listeners out there. And Andy, you can chime in here because you are our guy in Vegas who keeps the pulse on the contests. But correct me if I'm wrong, Andy. I think I read where the Circus Survivor contest has only 227 entries remaining. <laughs> yes, and uh, the wait till the people here as you're about to tell them what the implied value of each of those remaining 272 entries is worth. 
It's, it's unbelievable. $62,845 is what those oh, value wow. of those entries is. So that, and that's for a $1,000 investment. Andy, there used to be a site or a business that used to be able to, you could you could sell a ticket, a future. If you bought a future and you could sell it, just, just largely depending upon whether it was looking good or looking bad. Do you know if that site is still around? Yeah, and can I, have, I don't remember the name of it, but it could probably be Google. But yes, it uh, allowed yeah, you talking to about sell PropSwap? PropSwap, Prop yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's the one that, that it was. And, you know, if you're like, if it's like November and you're holding a ticket on... Uh, Let's say, well, let's say last year Baltimore was the number one seed in the AFC for most of the season. And let's say you had the Ravens as a, a future to win the Super Bowl at, let's say, 25 uh, uh, to 1, that you could probably sell it at a nice little profit at that point, probably not for 25 to 1, but you'd get something out of it, and somebody would be able to buy it at, let's say the, let's say the Ravens were uh, 12 to 1 at that point. You could probably get 15, 18 uh, to 1 on that ticket. Well, um, now there's only, like I mentioned here, 227 entries left. And that's because when Seattle and San Francisco both lost last week, they together, they wiped out 246 entries in the contest. So I think it's getting down to push comes to shove time, Andy. I know people save a lot of these uh, teams or these plays for uh, the Thanksgiving weekend because they count, you know, two plays in one week, the Christmas weekend, the same thing. Does anybody have anything saved that's worthy of using here moving forward? I think at this point, now, we did have a record field this year, 14,266, which was about 5,000 more, uh, 4,500 to 5,000 more than they had last year, which was another record year. The guarantee, I think, last year was uh, maybe 6 million. Uh, this year, it's 10 million, and they exceeded that. So a, a huge payday awaits. I think all that advanced planning that people did has somewhat gone out of the window to a certain extent because... You know, at this point of the year, we still had probably a good 50 to 60 percent of the field still remaining. We're only, you know, only five weeks into us into an 18-week or 20-week 20, 20 contest season. So now, I think the uh, the old survive and advance basically makes sense. There's no guarantee that this contest is going to reach uh, Thanksgiving week or the uh, Christmas week, which is Christmas week, I believe, is week 17 of the 18-week regular season schedule. So you'll have already made. Uh, 17 picks heading in because you'll have 18, 19, and then the final week, uh, 18, you'll make your 20th pick. So I think the strategy has changed completely. You still do have to be aware that uh, you want to have at least one, possibly two of those teams uh, available in case you you, uh, you make it uh, that far. But keep in mind, this is the fifth year of the contest. The first four years, even with a fewer number of entries, it's always gone to the final week, and there's always been a tie uh, for... Uh, uh, perfect. Uh, right now, player. it would be 20 and 0, yeah, that they would split. So, what would you make the over under number at, Andy, on um, when this, when the people that are alive, these 226 people that are alive, would agree to chop up the pot? How many people that would be left do you think they would agree to chop up the pot? I would, well, again, depending upon how deep it is, you know, let's say we get into early December and they've made it through, let's say, uh, 14 of the 20 contest weeks, so it would be right after Thanksgiving. I would say you'd probably have to get it down to, um, I was going to say single digits, but not with, uh, not with 14 million at stake. It might, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you get it down to about 14 contestants where, uh, let's say you can each guarantee, guarantee each person at least a million, yeah. or maybe, maybe if you cut it down to, um, you know, 10 million where you each get, you know, like 1.4 million and you play for the remaining four and a half million or something along those lines like they did last year. Hey, Jim, what would you do if, uh, if you were involved in holding one of these tickets? Uh, would you go all the way? Uh, I know you don't need the $14 million. <laughs> <laughs> Would you go all the way and sit out and make everybody play? Or at some point, where would you decide to chop up the pot? I'm, a, I'm always willing to take a profit. I believe exactly. it's a, you never go broke taking a profit. I'm not, that, I'm not in that. I'm, I wouldn't be that foolish. I know the guy did it last year, and I thought it was a very bad decision. No. I mean, I don't know his financial status, but it, that was that was a high risk, and, and uh, I would not have done that. And keep in mind, the investment you made is only a thousand dollars. So if you have a chance to cash out for a million dollars and become an instant millionaire, uh, at at the risk, and I put risk in quotes, of giving up possibly thirteen additional million, where there's no guarantee that uh, uh, that you won't survive another week, like the gentleman last year, uh, I think survived maybe one week, if that, if that at all. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a nice return for a $1,000 investment. 
Well, before we move on, I'll, I'll say this. I would be interested to see uh, when the final tally comes in, how many dogs people were forced to use this particular week. Usually not many, but some low-priced dogs do find their way onto the ticket here because of the saving situation and the games they've used. So it'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out this weekend. The Circa has really been one heck of a survivor contest this year. Mark, can I, I ask know, something sure. about yeah, the dog here? if I can? Yeah. Uh, it's been a good year for dogs in college football and in the NFL and ties in to some of the reasons that so many people are dropping like flies in the survivor based contests. Now, uh, in the NFL, 39, 37 and two ATS on the year. That's the record for just underdogs. And it's not that earth shattering. It's pretty much split right down the middle. But again, we've talked about it. It's the long dogs. My favorite dog is that foot long chili cheese dog. So we're talking about the long dogs in the NFL. Now this also depends on what line you're using in your database, closing line, opening line, game time line, whatever. In our playbook database, NFL underdogs of five and a half or more have gone 19 and two ATS in the season. There's a tie in there as well. 19 and two for dogs wow. of five and a half or more. The surprising thing is, They've gone 13 and nine straight up. They've won more than they even have lost. Not only wow. are they covering, they're winning outright and dropping people out of survivor pools. And you're, and you're talking nearly touchdown underdogs that are doing Right, and, and there's two last week. Not only did they cover, they both won outright. Arizona over the Niners and the Giants over the Seahawks. There's about four or five of the long dogs going this week in the NFL. And you pretty much know what to do in that regard. Is that by the way? From, uh, from, a betting, from a betting standpoint, the, all the people that take the sevens and do, do teasers and drop it down, they're getting killed. Yeah. The teasers absolutely get murdered when you drop them down those yeah. favorites. By the way, it brings up an interesting question regarding Survivor if you're looking ahead to next year. Will there be increased participation because of the size of the pool, or will so many people say, wait a minute? You know, I paid a thousand dollars this year, and I didn't last two weeks. And there are, you know, several. You know, there are like eight to ten thousand of those people. And the other aspect of this is, will more people get in next year and take multiple entries? Uh, you asked the question of what the strategy would be and how many people would be willing to cut a deal at what point. I think what I would want to take a look at before making a decision on that is how many entries of, of those 227 remaining. How many uh, are there? 227 people with one entry each. Or are there maybe eight people that have ten entries and another seven who have six or five? And then how many individual people or groups, if you will, uh, control those 272 entries? Because that might I've that actually, make I've a actually thought about that, Andy. And, and I, as these quarterbacks are getting more experienced, as the coaches are becoming more experienced, I think we're going to start to see some more rational play. And because... This already we've seen one coach get fired. I think there's probably three others that should should go also. But but I think we're going to get a little bit more stability than we well we have to get more stability yeah. than we have this year. It's illogical to think it can keep doing this. So I, matter of fact, I was thinking about buying ten entries next year, and I have not played the Survivor yeah. since Circuit started it. But I actually think it might be quite exciting. With a little bit more stability, so the handicapping actually matters, because this year it really doesn't. Well, Jim, I'll get you in my local Cleveland Survivor contest. We had uh, <laughs> we had 172 people each put a thousand dollars into it, and after four weeks, there were four people left, and they wow. chopped it up. They no, it didn't no. even make yeah, it didn't okay. even make October. How about that? Wow. <laughs> so, how many people did you say you had? 172. One? So that's uh, forty-three thousand dollars each. Yeah, they took the money and ran. Exactly. Mark, were you one of those four? No, <laughs> I was not. Uh, we got wiped out on a, what dumped everybody. You know, it was a favorite who I do not, and I despise using the biggest favorite in those contests because when they lose, the whole pool wipes out. Yeah, but unfortunately, Mark, I know that every week you were, put, you were probably betting on Cleveland. Well, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be doing it this week in a survivor pool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that no, that Mark, what you said, that's what happened in week one. Remember New England, like a nine, nine and a half point favorite at Cincinnati? That wiped out a significant part of the field. Sure I, I would have normally considered Cincinnati, except for the fact that it was almost obvious they were going to be the number one choice. I said, I don't want to go down with Cincinnati in week one. 
I'd rather go, de- go down with them in week three, which is what happened. And did you go down with Baltimore in week two? <laughs> no. No, good. No, because, because what was happening is, uh, I forget who I had in week two, but I was looking to use, um, I think, the Raiders in week three, figuring they were going to be coming off a loss in Baltimore when they hosted Carolina in their first home game. But, of course, uh, when uh, Carolina pulled that upset, I could no longer play the Raiders in week, uh, I mean, when, when, um, should be, when the Raiders pulled the upset in Baltimore in week two with that fourth quarter rally, I could no longer back them in week three, figuring a letdown, and that's what happened mm-hmm. when they uh, uh, went to, uh, uh, when Carolina went in there and beat them pretty handily. So I think I ended up, I forget what I took Cincinnati. It was one of like one or two, re- one or two teams, and I didn't feel all that strong, but I felt confident enough to figure that Cincinnati at the point was 0-2, and uh, they were a better football team than that. And, you know, they're one and four now, so I don't know how much better they are, and they may lose to the Giants this week. Well, guys, what do you say? Let's move it over to our college football game of the weekend. Uh, personally, I think this is a really attractive-looking college football card. Uh, you've got quite a few good teams taking points, and that's usually the price of admission for me. And uh, our college football game of the week, we're going to roll back to an old rivalry, the Red River rivalry, say that three times in a row, uh, between <laughs> Oklahoma and Texas, but it's SEC style this year. They both moved in the SEC. Uh, if you will, I'm going to go around the horn and see what your opinions are in this particular game. You like it, you don't like it, uh, you're going to pass, you're going to play it, and what stands out to you. And with that Tony Mejia, Oklahoma, Texas, how do you see the Red River rivalry shaking out this week? Well, forget it, it used to be the shootout, but it, that, oh, that was not PC enough. So now it's the showdown or the rivalry. Your choice. But yeah, this one's at the Cotton Bowl. Sometimes they played it, I guess, at Jerry World. This one's in Dallas. And it's the 120th one, first time in 30 years where Texas is number one. And the odds makers certainly making them pay for that. It's 14 and a half, 15 points. Definitely more than I wanted to lay, but I can only see Texas in this game. I think if Oklahoma pulls it off, it'll be because Quinn Ewers who I believe is going to play, is, is Rusty coming off the injury. He hasn't played since the UTSA game on September 14th, so almost the full calendar month will have passed since he took a snap. You guys can hear me okay, right? Yes. Yep. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, I think I think yours will be fine. I think he's an upgrade on Arch Manning. Uh, certainly Manning's done pretty well uh, filling his shoes, but I, I like yours, uh game experience in a matchup like this. Oklahoma's defense is by far uh, the, the drawing card for them uh, this year. And obviously their head coach is a defensive guy. Um, they, they were able to contain Tennessee and stay in that game because of that defense, although the balls have really slowed down over the last couple of weeks and lost at Arkansas last uh, week because they could not get anything going offensively. But certainly the Sooners provided a blueprint for how to stop them. Uh, and then offensively, Oklahoma's got a true freshman uh, quarterback in Michael Hawkins who uh, will get things done with his feet. I mean, he's really fleet of foot, uh, more than his arm at this point. They've got a bunch of receivers down. That, to me, I think uh, kind of deflates me on the, well, yeah, let's count on a backdoor cover because I think Texas is going to be up in this game, and the fact that Oklahoma's receiving core is as limited as it is and Hawkins is more of a scrambler than a thrower, uh, means that I can't easily think, all right, well, if it's a 20-point game late, uh, Oklahoma can pull one back and cover this number. So for me, it's Texas or pass, um, it, but uh, again, another opportunity for the Longhorns to flex a little muscle as uh, the number one team in the country. It's Texas Longhorns for Tony Mejia. Victor, how do you see this Red River, Red River showdown shaking out this particular week? Tony brought out some great points about the uh, fact that for a while there, Oklahoma was down to like their fifth and sixth wide receivers. They were that hurt in the wide receiver department. He also mentioned the fact that they're reverted to a true freshman at quarterback now. Uh, These are things that to me are pointing to this game under the total. But let's circle back a little bit. It's a low line, that's for sure. What, it opened 51 and a half? It's down to about 50 and a half as we record the podcast. And the Longhorn defense, very, very impressive this year. Number six overall, number four in yards per play involved. They may even be better than last year's version, which is uh, surprising considering Texas lost some big money defensive players to the NFL. Now, Oklahoma, let me see, they, they enter four and one. They bounce back from that loss against Tennessee. 
with a win against Auburn. But there are two things, again, that you need to take away from that loss. I'm sorry, from that win. The offense did not look much better at all with that freshman quarterback, Hawkins Jr. And once again, they needed their defense to bail them out once again with a clutch pick six in the game. They are ranked now 127th in offensive success rate. They generated less than 300 yards per game against Auburn last week. On the flip side, the Longhorns, they don't only have the best defense in this game, Oklahoma's defense uh, is looking very, very good, even comparable, uh, if you will, with those impressive uh, Brent Venables units that we saw at Clemson all those years ago. They rank uh, number 11th in the country in EPA yards per play. Uh, not to mention, he did a good job last year of limiting Quinn Ewers in that meeting. Now, of Texas aside here, Sarkeesian, he knows this. And with this being Ewers' first game in almost a month, you got to expect the Longhorns are we going to lean hard into their world-class offensive line and their running game. So I'm not playing the under in the game, Mark, but I'm playing under in the first half. I think while the Texas defense should make things hard on Hawkins, I can see this being a slightly lower scoring version of the matchup. Uh, that said, this is the Red River rivalry. There's been plenty of shootouts in the past. Don't forget, you know who Texas plays next week? Georgia. So uh, pedal to the metal for 60 minutes for Texas? I don't see it. But what we are going to do is I'm going to keep my under in the first half, under 25 and a half points, where these arrivals should be in a first half kind of feeling out process before they potentially open things up in the second half. I think the best play in regards to the total is under 25 and a half in the first half. Real good analysis there, Victor. An interesting point with Georgia being on deck for Texas. Greg, let me ask you this. I know we participate in the Our Lads Weekly College Football Rankings. And if, let's just say, for example, that uh, when Texas does play Georgia and Georgia beats Texas, who becomes the number one team in college football at that particular point good in the one. season? Well, I haven't put that together, but uh, again, because of my schedule hasn't been really good the last couple of weeks, <laughs> but we're going to release uh, this week's schedule, uh, hopefully later tonight or tomorrow, but I think it's easy, and that is uh, as long as Ohio State beats Oregon, it'll be Ohio State. Yeah, the Buckeyes look to be the most likely choice. Uh, but if they don't, then it becomes interesting. Well, then Georgia has that chip on their shoulder again. You know, what do we do? We knocked off the undefeated number one team, and, you know, we don't move at all in the poll. You know? what, if, what if Penn State goes out and hammers USC this week? Uh, they'd be undefeated. Miami had struggles. They're still unbeaten. I'm trying to think who else might be up there as far as, uh, well, I guess Oregon could even make a case, even though they're, mm -hmm. un, you know, they're unbeaten, and if they beat Ohio yeah. State, even though it's right. at home. I would think that uh, should the Texas lose and should Ohio State lose, It'll be one of those, uh, it'll be either Penn State or uh, Oregon. The, the biggest story would probably be if Texas loses, the matchup next week of two powerhouse one-loss teams. One of those teams will be, would be two losses, and then you know they're in that situation where you probably can't lose. As great as a team you are, you're probably not going to get into the playoffs with three losses. Well, they might, Greg, just given the fact that uh, once these conference championships are sorted out and the winners are declared, then it's going to it'll all break down from that point forward to the rankings of where these football teams rank. So if you find, for instance, a, uh, a Georgia ranked number 11 or uh, a Texas ranked number 10 at that particular stage, they will be in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. That, 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 yeah. It's a great point, Mark. That's the basically the saving grace. If, if somehow you lose three games, say you're Georgia in the regular season – uh, all we got to do is win the SEC championship. We'll be in the playoffs. Which, by the way, brings up a point that I've hammered home for years. When you look at schedule, you know how a lot of these uh, programs make their uh, games against FBS teams back in September? The SEC, I think probably two-thirds of them, save those games for like the first or second week in November uh, because they realize that there'll be other big matchups that week between traditional rivals and teams that are fighting for conference championships. And one of them will have to lose. And so let's say a team like, uh, let's say an LSU, who might be like number seven 
going into that week. They'll win by 56 to nothing over Furman or something. They can move up one or two spots depending upon the uh, uh, upon, depending upon the results of the teams who are playing, you know, fellow FBS teams. It's something that the SEC has done for probably about 15, 20 years. And even though from a football fan standpoint, uh, uh, it's not all that appealing to see those kind of games scheduled in November, the SEC, know, SEC knows what it's doing because it does work. Yeah, that's always been the fly in the ointment for me, the SEC scheduling these pancakes in November. I don't know if they use them as prep games, practice games, or like you mentioned, Andy, just to kind of move up a spot or two in the rankings. Jim, I know you're much, much bigger in the National Football League than you are college football, but I have to feel that this game is going to gather your attention one way or another. And if it does, which side of this football game will you probably be looking at? Well, I'm more. I'm, I'm not an originator in, any longer after doing it for many years in college uh, football, but um, I do follow and read everything, study everything, and have been doing very well doing that. So I'm going to base what I bet on I'm going to ask a question of Victor, because I know he's the best at totals. If you were going to bet a team total, high or low, over or under, in this game, what choice would you make? Boy, that's a good question. What do you do? We have what the numbers. Are? Yes, we are. I've got the numbers right here. Team totals. Texas 31 and a half, Oklahoma 16 and a half. 31, it's the, the perfect key number in college football. That's four touchdowns and it's a field goal. Oklahoma 16 and a half. They're begging you to bet the over and that. To, for me, it would probably be Oklahoma 116 and a half. Under 16 and a half. Okay. Very, oh, good. very, Thank very you. interesting. Thank you. Very interesting. Andy, how do you see the Red River rivalry coming well, that, down? That would, that would put the total at 48, wouldn't it? Uh, 31 and a half, 16 and a half? And I thought the total was a little bit higher uh, than that. 30, 47, it would put it at 48 and the game line, let me see here. I think you said 50, didn't you? 51, I thought. It's down to 49. Oh, oh okay. Down, it's okay. down it to sense. 49, there then, you go. That makes sense. There's yeah. the answer. There's yeah. the answer. I actually, you know, I write up uh, you know, f uh, four college and four NFL games each week, and so uh, one of them happens to be this Oklahoma-Texas uh, game. And as has been alluded to, it's been long known as the Red River, sh Red River Shootout. And that's, uh, however, transitioned from a Big 12 play to the SEC as both the Sooners and Longhorns are in their first seasons as members of the uh, top-rated college football uh, conference. It's been a very competitive rivalry over the past decade, except for Texas's 49-0 route of Oklahoma back two years ago in 2022, which was Venable's first year as a coach of, uh, of Oklahoma, uh, played annually in Dallas aside from two seasons ago. The other nine regular season meetings over the past decade have been decided, uh, well, I'm sorry, eight of the previous nine uh, have been decided by four, seven, eight, seven, three, five, five, and seven points. So, yeah, that's the other nine, uh, nine games. So that's been an incredibly... Uh, tight series, one score possession series, and we're talking not over a three to five year period, we're talking nine out of the last ten years. And a lot of it has to do with both of these programs have long produced a lot of NFL talent over the years, and even this year's team, even though you hear all about uh, uh, Texas's uh, talent, which is tremendous, Oklahoma still has some future NFL talent on uh, that team as well. Uh, the way that I expect this game to go is pretty much the way like uh, Victor explained it. I think it's going to be a, a slowly unfolding game. Uh, the, two, the fundamental aspect that I look at are um, uh, yards per rush and yards per pass completion. I've talked about before. I don't care about yards per attempt. It's apples and oranges. I want to know when passes are completed, what's the average distance gained on those passes? Texas allows 7.7 .7 yards per pass completion, which uh, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I can't believe any team is lower than that as far as uh, that. Uh, and they average 14 yards per completion on offense. Uh, Oklahoma about average. They average 10 yards per play when they complete a pass and 12.9 when they allow a pass completion. So that does have a huge edge for Texas. At the same time, Texas averages 5.0 yards per rush, but Oklahoma, they are allowing only 2.6 yards per rush. So now the question becomes, and, and, and uh, Victor brought this up, does Texas try to exploit the supposed or the statistical advantage they have in passing the football against that Oklahoma difference, uh, di uh, defense? 
or do they try to keep yours in the game as long as possible, work on the running game, and even though Oklahoma doesn't allow a lot of yardage, they ultimately wear the Sooners down. You know, let's say if they run the, the football 40, 45 times in that game. But again, it just goes back to me because these are such bitter rivals. Oklahoma does great recruiting in Texas. Texas does great recruiting in Oklahoma. With nine out of the last 10 games coming down to uh, uh, one score, I have to take the points with Oklahoma. Andy Isco takes the points with Oklahoma despite revealing his secret sauce of what it is that he uses when he looks at these football games. Yards per pass completion, really, really good numbers. Drastic differences, if you will, in this football game. Uh, I'm going to take also a small side to Oklahoma in the contest here. I'm, I love history and I love stats. And, you know, I like situations where you put teams in roles where they've had difficulty overcoming those particular roles. And you look at this series here, and the last 25 times they played, Oklahoma's won 18 of these games. Only four losses by more than 10 points for the Sooners. And if you also take a look, this is only the second time Oklahoma's been a double-digit dog in this series the last 25 years. The two times they were double-digit dogs, they won one of those games straight up as a 26-point dog. They beat Oklahoma straight up on the field. So, you know, does the double digits come into, into play in this game? I think from a player's mental aspect, yeah, it's like you're slating me. You, you're, what's the odds makers think? We're a double-digit underdog? Um, and that's, that's the mentality the that they often time to go out and play in. That and the fact that I love the fade number one ranked teams in big football games because I think it's where they tend to lump up, if you will, more often than, than, than they don't. So in this Red River rivalry, I'll take the points with Oklahoma in this football game here as well this particular week. By, by the way, Mark, just to let you know, Power ratings do support this point spread. So that's, it's, it's not like this is an unusual line. It's just that the, the non-fundamentals that you and I have both talked about, I think also are worth some points in this game. I expect Texas to win the game, but I expect it to once again be competitive. I'm with you. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And... Well, before we move over to the NFL side of things, I want to remind everybody to get your copy of the Playbook Totals Chip Sheet newsletter off another solid winning week with best bets last week. Winning season's 14 in the last 17 years. You can get the NFL team total of the week. That was 72 and 35 coming into the season, uh, the NFL totals of the week, and they feature NFL total over under best bets each and every week. You can subscribe at playbooksports.com for the NFL totals tip sheet. Do it today. And if it's not there, when you log on to the website, it's that darn server. It'll be up soon, guys. But when you go there, be sure to check out the totals chip sheet. If you do, you'll be glad you did just that. Okay, guys, let's move it over now, as I mentioned, to our NFL game of the week this particular week. And we've got a couple, of, not a real deep card, if you will, in the National Football League, but I think a couple of interesting games, uh, to say the least. And uh one of them is going to be a, a, a crosstown rivalry, if you will. Only 30 miles separate Baltimore and Washington uh, between these two football teams. So there's not a lot of travel involved uh, for the visiting team here. Anyway, that's Washington in this particular football game. Uh, and this will also be one of only two games on the entire card this weekend in the NFL that involve winning teams playing in the same game. So that makes the card sort of thin that way, if you will, when you're looking at quality teams and you're looking for quality teams taking points. This might be one of those two games because it's one of the only two games, as I mentioned here. So, you know, that being the case in a situation just like this, Greg De Palma, I'm going to ask you uh, your take here on this football game between Baltimore and Washington. Is there a letdown here for either of these two football teams? Well, if you look at the fact that if, if there's a letdown, it's definitely on the Baltimore side uh, based on the fact that uh, – not only did they come off of a division game, but they come off of a, you know just a game that uh, just wore them out uh, physically and mentally, and uh, big win for them. But it does have to take out a little bit. Uh, whereas Washington, they just keep on surprising teams, and it's and it's just what they're doing is just so fantastic. Uh, reminds us, like we talked about in the preseason, Mark, about uh, the Houston Texans that the Washington uh, Commanders could possibly pull it off. And that's what we talked about, and it's exactly what's happening. Uh, it's, it's so great when that kind of comes through the way that you, uh, you, you think it could. And, and they're just off to a great start. But what I look at is some really conflicting trends from, of course, the Playbook Magazine, Playbook Football Preview Guide. 
Uh, we've got Baltimore covering eight straight before Monday Night Football. They're going to be at Tampa Bay next week. And i got to ask you about that, Mark. Um, what do you think that means? Do you think that's just chance? Or is there something behind that? About teams before a Monday night game? Yeah, being, being cut, you know, I can look at it maybe the other way. Well, they dropped eight straight covers the week before Monday night football because they're thinking about Monday night football. But to cover eight straight before Monday night football is kind of interesting. I'm going to defer this to Jim Feist, uh, Jim, because my take on that is this, is that there was a time back in the Howard Cosell days when Monday night football was everything. It was the game that was spotlighted, yeah. showcased, and the players really, really look forward to playing that. I don't know if it's the same thing this particular year. I don't know if players are geeked up because they're going to be playing on Monday Night Football. What's your take on that, Jim? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it, it matters as much because, you know, back in the day, there weren't that many national TV games. Now every game's on TV. Every game is, especially like you know, Baltimore is, you know, they're, they're one of the best teams in football. And so they're on TV a lot. I don't think it, it, it hangs them up. And, and, you know, we have so much more out there. They're on TV. They're doing interviews all the time. It's not, it's not as much. But I have a side question here. Tampa Bay just got hit with a couple of hurricanes. Is there going to be a game in Tampa next week? Well, oh, did they, that, didn't they go to New Orleans? Uh, they got out of Yeah, the, well, they're playing there now. But next week, we're, is, there more, is there enough damage in Tampa that they would not be able to do that? I, the, the South Florida Memphis game was moved from Friday to Saturday, and it's supposed to go off at, at Raymond James Stadium. Right, right, indicating yeah. hardly any damage at all. Right, Tony. Yeah, yeah. but, but I, again, that that was that was stated before the hurricane actually hit. So I'm not. I mean, I would say 80 percent, it'll be fine. I know right. UCF, uh, they're hosting this weekend uh, Cincinnati, and that is also touch and go before we got on uh, on the air here. So. Tony, I, there, I was wonder, I wonder, there was a lot of damage. There was a lot of damage to the baseball stadium, uh, right? Well, they ruined the baseball stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that one's. That's, that's, that's going to be interesting to see what happens with the with the truck. Is that they're already building a new stadium, so that if they got to fix the roof, I mean, there's too many <laughs> <laughs> too many rain delays uh, in yeah. Tampa. Otherwise, so. yeah, if they schedule games, there, it'll be nothing but a rain delay, right? <laughs> the only thought, the only thought there is, and I don't know what the capacities are with all the spring training stadiums for the clubs that play down there, but they might go and play somewhere at one of those stadiums that, uh, let's say, has the, uh, the the furthest outfield walls. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty. Nightbrenner uh, Field for, for where the Yankees play is right there, and probably the nicest facility in, in Florida, so it's right in their backyard. To not to bypass the, the question, Mark, I, I don't think it needs as much, but, I mean, this, this matchup between Washington and Baltimore is quite interesting. I mean, yeah. you, have two, you have the young Lamar Jackson style player, although they're not exactly the same. But it's pretty amazing. This could be a hell of a hell of a game to watch. From and and look at the look at the total. And I know Victor has something to say about the total. Mm -hmm. the, the number on this game is massively high. I don't think we've had a total this high all year. Um, yeah, it, 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 go ahead, Vic. As, as long as you're throwing it my way, let's talk the total first. And we're somewhere in the 52 to 53 range. Who doesn't want to play for a fantastic shootout between a couple of really <laughs> potent offenses? But I'll tell you this, uh, in the NFL these days, over under lines of 49 or higher have been the kiss of death for over the total betters. This year, uh, right It's not this year now. Uh, it's the last, let me see here. I've got that in my totals. We saw it last week with San Francisco and Arizona. In fact, we even wrote a little blurb about it here in the Totals Tip Sheet newsletter about they've been kiss of death. Um, this goes back to late in the 2022 season. So we're talking, oh, just about two full years. NFL games with an over under line of 49 or higher, seven overs, 29 unders. That's 81% of all games under the total. So for me, in good conscience, I cannot bet the full game over. It's either going to be pass on it or bet the under in the game. Um, not, not only that, but these games have gone 5-22 and 22 over under on Sundays, including a perfect 
0 and 7 over under this season. NFL Sunday games with a line of 49 or higher, 0 and 7 over under. So I can't play the total. I can't play the over. In good conscience, we cannot. With that said, guys, I kind of like Washington and the points in this game, and I know they may be <laughs> what they call a public underdog, and they say what's worse than betting a public favorite is a public underdog. It does seem like Washington is generating a lot of money in the game. But with that said, we know Lamar has been great against NFC teams, 21-1 and one straight up, Lamar, but only 11-11 11 and 11 ATS. Now, I also queried the fact that you got a big home favorite and a high over underline. So here's the query, the database. Non-division home favorites, six or greater. Over underline is 50 or more. These games have gone 8 and 25 ATS. That's against Baltimore. That is on Washington in the last seven seasons, 8 and 25. Big home favorites with a really, really high over underline. Uh, and not to mention, there is a really good play against situation for teams who played an overtime game the previous week, like Baltimore did against Cincinnati. When they're facing a team that did not play an overtime game, uh, these teams lose about 60% of the time in the last 10 years. So even though they may be a public dog, I do think Washington can hang in this game, but we're not going to touch the total. This would be similar uh, to what you guys uh, talked about before, Vic, and that is the. Uh, this is just Washington's another dog. Another they're one of those dog. big dogs, right? Yeah, nineteen and two. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. So and that doesn't mean they're going to win, but it it definitely, like you said, there's a lot to like. Even just taking the points. Matter of fact, Dan Quinn again was able to get this here. Dan Quinn, sixteen and four lifetime, as a dog following a straight up win. And he's 3-0 and in that spot this year, all in the last three weeks. So uh, take that uh, with what you want. But on the flip side, I will give another good one to Baltimore, which again, that's why I said conflicting. Baltimore is 14-2 and against the spread after a division road game when they take on a non-division opponent. So I just think this is one of those games where if I'm going to take the game, I'm definitely going to take Baltimore just for the heck of it. Um, but you do kind of wonder, I mean, how much longer can Washington just keep this up? Uh, it, it's just they're, they're playing so well. Well, for what it's worth, guys, I'm going to side to the Washington side of the football game in this contest. Uh, number one, my allegiance to dogs. But uh, more than that, uh, I think Dan Quinn has made a wonderful job improving this football team. We talked about it early on in the beginning of the season, how we expected improvement from Washington this year. If for no other reason they were dead last in the league in turnover margin last year, and those teams the next year improved tremendously or vastly, that was expected from Washington. But looking inside our coaches' database, this jumps out at me about Dan Quinn and not only the job he's done with this football team, but his best role that he's in this particular week. And that best role for Dan Quinn is when he's been an underdog coming off a win in his career. He's 15-4 and four to the spread. 5-0, and oh, straight up into the number. The last five times, he's been an underdog coming off a win. So I think that momentum may help carry over for Washington in this particular football game. Don't know for sure which way it's going to go. Tony Mejia, how do you see this game shaking out? I mean, it's an interesting one because I think it, it, it's not a letdown spot for the Ravens, even though it probably would be if Washington were having their conventional 1-4 and four start. The fact that they're sharing uh, clips in the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun with this team has to uh, you know, have them on the uh, on the radar. And the fact that their defense, the Ravens' defense, has struggled, uh, you know, over the last oh, really all season, and they they were only given a reprieve in winning that game in Cincinnati because Zach Taylor is a fool, and I mean, who, who plays so <laughs> conservatively? It, 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 we play so conservatively to, to set up a 52-yard field goal. I mean, we, we talked about the the, the uh, overtime games and the rigors of that, but the defense was on the field for three plays and barely had to move. So yeah, and it wasn't you know, a six-six game, Tony. It's a four, a 48-48 game. So you know, we got some offense going here. Yeah, exactly. And, and look, the, the deal with the, with I, I think I think for, for starters, 
I would lean to the over um, from from what I, I read on, on the gold sheet this week. This is the highest total involving the uh, commanders uh, in years since 2021. So, but, but I was on the high side as, as actually my top play on the commanders Cardinals game, which uh, the commanders did pretty much all the work to get Same that here. over. Yeah. Yeah. Mid, um, yeah, mid fourth quarter. Uh, thank you uh, to Dean Daniels there. Because uh, <laughs> right. you know, we we didn't get much from Kyler Murray in that game, but uh, yeah. look, I, so I, I think I think if you're Cliff Kingsbury, you're salivating at the thought of throwing on the the Ravens' pass defense, which just has given up big play after big play. They really haven't gotten stops. It's been the primary culprit of why this Ravens team doesn't have a better record than it does. Why it got off to such a slow start, uh, you know, in games against the Chiefs and whatnot. But for for me, I do I do think that the Ravens are favored by the right amount of points because Washington got you know defeated soundly by Tampa Bay and the rest of the teams that they played on the schedule not impressive. We talked about the Bengals that was an impressive win on the road on a Monday night, but again Cincinnati has just been subpar all year, um, off the field issues with contract disputes and whatnot. T. Higgins injured, and he came back for that game. You've got Arizona, which they, who, who they blew out of the water, and that was an Arizona spot, given that it was a short week situation for Washington. But um, you know, really, step it, it was once again uh, a clinic from Daniels in terms of making the right passes and uh, playing consistently. And then last week, the Cleveland Browns are a mess, as we all know. So this is a very tough situation for Washington. Uh, I think Baltimore can play with the lead if they if they go ahead and establish the run game as they have in every game pretty much this season. So um, what? it is the Baltimore spot and do I like the total? I would like it to the over if Daniels can get them a backdoor cover late because I think Baltimore's pass defense is vulnerable. I'd like to add something to this. Washington leads the league in no huddle offense. Yes. They don't yeah. huddle. They just keep going into the next play, next play, oh, next yeah. play, which is quite unusual when you have a rookie quarterback, yeah. which is giving a lot of credit to his ability to think on his own and yeah. make adjustments, which is remarkable. Nobody does that, especially with rookies. That's, I, that's, I... It's, that leads, I mean, you're going to get more plays and with – Baltimore coming in off an overtime game against the division rival that they probably should have lost to, and their defense hasn't been that good. Um, neither team has a really great defense. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. The stats in the 49 points and, and going under is, you know, that's, that's why I think when it hit 53, you did see some under money. Because it did come down. I was, I was going to mention that, because um, I hadn't mentioned on this one yet, I'm going to a couple of points Tony made. Baltimore is usually a very strong defensive team, but in most years, it's a balanced defense. Take a look this year, yards per game, rushing, they rank number one, allowing 60 yards per game, passing number 31, allowing 260 passing yards per game. Now, yes, admittedly, uh, Baltimore's in the lead, but first of all, keep in mind that they – they didn't play well against the Raiders in the fourth quarter than the game they should have won. And against Dallas, they were up, uh, what was it, I think 28 to 6 or something entering the fourth quarter, and they ended up holding on for a 28-25 win. So, and again, another decline. And we saw them struggle against Cincinnati basically for the whole uh, game last week. Now, pointing out, uh, and, and Tony mentioned this, and I will point out that, yeah, they got beaten by Tampa Bay. But remember, that was week one. It was on the road. It was the first game for Daniels as a rookie quarterback. It was the first game as a head coach of the uh, commanders for Dan Quinn. They haven't lost since. Um, I find it hard in a situation like that. And again, the number kind of makes sense, although I don't think Washington is quite yet getting the kind of respect that their performances have shown they deserve. You know, I, I, I have to be on Washington in this game. Now, were they playing a defense such as the Chargers? the Broncos, uh, the Steelers, I might not be so comfortable taking the six and a half points, but given what we've seen out of that past defense of the Ravens, there's no reason. Uh, as we uh, 
as we've seen many times with some of these past t passing teams. As we've seen many times with some of these past passing, t passing teams and some of the weak passing teams. You know, I don't teams. think this is uh, What I think to me, the, the, the fact that, I mean, Washington 10-3 dating back to last season, season with a different quarterback, different coaching staff to the over. Uh, and, you know, the 4-1 and one this year should be 5-0 and oh because they settled for seven field goals against the Giants. So Daniels has gotten the red zone uh, issues ironed out over the past few weeks. So, yeah, my play on this, I, I, I'm in wait-and-see mode on Washington to beat a quality team like Baltimore because, you know, as I mentioned, not really impressed with uh, – I'm, I'm impressed with how they've handled the last three weeks, but the teams are what they are. Uh, but I think that the Kingsbury no huddle – Kingsbury no Daniels, huddle, Daniels uh, you know, being uh, effective beyond his years thing probably, probably plays, plays into this game. So my, my play would be on the open. And keep in mind, too, this should not be a surprise, and that's the fact that Baltimore now is down to, like, their third or fourth defensive coordinator change uh, because the guys that are leaving are, are leaving most of them for better job opportunities. So sooner or later, and I think you're seeing that with San Francisco as well, sooner or later you can't keep, repl you can't keep going to, oh, we've got a really good defensive coordinator. And then he leaves. We got a really good defense. Sooner or later, you don't have really good defensive coordinators. And the guy that they have, Zachary Orr, was playing football for them a couple of years ago. So he doesn't have a ton of experience. He's never been a coordinator before. So I don't think it's that big of a surprise that Baltimore's defense has not been as good as people think so far this year. So, Jim, I, I let you evade the question. You threw some nice commentary out there. But uh, what, how, what do you see happens here, Washington or Baltimore? Jim, are you with us? Or better yet, can you guys hear me? Yes, we I can, can hear you, Mark. Jim okay. must be on mute. Okay. There he is, yes. Hey, you can't hear Jim. We cannot hear Jim. Okay. We will check back in once Jim checks back in. That being the case, we've wrapped up and covered our NFL football game of the week. And I'm going to turn these things over now to Greg De Palma for our 60-second countdown as Greg's going to take a spin around the roundtable with all of our guys to find out what question, comment, trend, or commentary they might have on any one particular game on this weekend's particular card. Greg, I'm handing it over to you. All right. So, again, uh, these are one minute, one minute only. And uh, once I... Uh... Oh, and if Jim is hopefully fixing his mic, so when he comes back, he'll get that minute. Uh, but uh, this is, again, as you said, Mark, an opportunity for uh, each of our handicappers to let us know what they want to talk about. They got a pick, they got a game, uh, anything at all. Uh, of course, they can promote also anything they want. So let's go ahead and start with Andy. Andy, you're going to go first. So are you ready for the one minute countdown? Well, I will do my best, and I'm going to go to one of the more intriguing college games of the weekend. Um, I actually wrote up three games this week, four games this week, as I mentioned. Three of them were in the SEC. This is the one that I wrote up that is not the SEC. It's in the ACC, the game between Pitt and California. Uh, Pitt is 5-0, and oh, and they certainly have an opportunity to run the table. Cal is struggling, and they're coming off of that heartbreaking loss last week to uh, Miami, where they had the game seemingly in control, but couldn't hold on to a 25-point lead. And that was a game that Miami earned, as opposed to the game the week before against Virginia Tech. But look at what Cal's had to do this year. They played at home to open the season, then they go out and win at Auburn. They go back home to play another game, then they go back out and lose a 14-9 game at uh, Florida State. Then they go back home and play another game, and now they're back out on the East Coast again, this time up a little bit north. That travel has to take a lot out of teams that are going basically 3,000 miles across the country over a period of maybe five or six weeks. I like what I'm seeing out of Narduzzi's team this year. Uh, this may be the biggest test for Pittsburgh, but California's also had some difficulty. We saw it last week defending the pass against Miami. Pittsburgh does that very well. They're about a three, three and a half point favorite, and I would think that uh, things catch up to Cal this week. All right. Uh, six seconds over, so uh, I'll trim yeah. that for you. Don't forget these are I'll, all. I'll, I'll do that next week. I'll take six seconds off. <laughs> yeah, you owe us six seconds. <laughs> <laughs> These are all going to be turned into shorts. So uh, just so you know, whether it's this week or in the future, uh, anybody that is watching, these will be shorts. So if you miss a show, don't worry. The shorts will be up there, and you're going to get each one of these handicappers giving their opinions on, uh, on what they want to talk about for a minute. So let's uh, turn now to Tony. Tony, you ready? I'm ready. Ready when you are. Let me know. Not going to talk about Central Florida, are you? 
Uh, it's UCF and no. Okay, sounds good. Go ahead, Tony. All right. We will talk about Friday night in the Big 12. It's Pac-12 after dark, so it's uh, otherwise. Utah, Arizona State. And stop me if you've heard this before, but it's Cam Rising potentially playing. <laughs> Uh, and the uh, rising is supposed to play off of a bye week. Uh, he has obviously not played since the Baylor game in early September, so it's been over a month now. But uh, coming off a bye and a loss at home to Arizona, a rarity for Utah, I think he'll be in the mix. And the spread is short, although it is coming up with, uh, with rising probably slated to play. So it's now four and a half, five as opposed to four. I'd still lay the points with Utah. Uh, Utah, the preseason pick to win the Big 12. Arizona State projected to uh, bring up the rear. ASU looks great, but Utah will get the job done, lay the points with the Eagles. All right, Tony, making up the six seconds and more from Andy. Uh, 50 seconds. Nice going, Tony. All right. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> You're welcome. I could have gone more, but I, I don't have that internal clock uh, tuned on as as efficiently by the way it doesn't really work that way anyway so uh it's uh it, it, it i won't have to trim anything so i appreciate that all right next up victor hey. you ready yeah guys uh we're gonna talk about a um a tuco play our boy tuco and he's gonna be going over the total in the first half of the dallas detroit game no we're not playing the full game over over underlines too high for my taste right now. But this brings back fond memories from last season because we played numerous first half overs in Dallas games and they went 12, four and one over under in the first half. They were tied for best record in terms of overs with Philadelphia. And that also included seven and one to the over in the games played at Jerry's world. Not to mention they've already started out the 2024 season with a four and one over under record in the first half of their games, the Dallas Cowboys. Meanwhile, you got the rested and relaxed Lions. They're coming off their bye. Number three statistical offense in the entire league. They were one of the best road over teams last year. We're going to play over 26 and a half in the first half. All right. You, that was just about on time there. Excellent, Vic. Hey, it was only about a second or two over. So, Great job. Now, uh, we're going to go to Mark. We're going to give Jim all the time he needs to fix that. Are you, oh, by the way, are you fixed, Jim? No, he's not fixed. Uh, Jim, you might have to call in and come back because I'm not sure that anything else is going to fix it. So you might want to go ahead and try that. All right. So, Mark, you're going to go ahead and uh, take up the spot here while we wait for Jim. So are you ready for your one minute? I'm ready for my one minute, Greg, and it's going to be in London, England this week, where Jacksonville takes on Chicago. And I look at this game from two ways. And usually when you handicap a game, you find something you like, you fall in love with the side. The deeper you look, you find something else, and it goes the other way. So what do you do in a game like this? You probably stay out of it. But the side that I found that I liked in this game was the fact that Jacksonville this season is struggling because they've allowed season high yards against every opponent they played this year. Terrible. The only team in the NFL to do that. So it's, you, now you take a look at Jacksonville from an offensive statistical standpoint, their net YPR, meaning their yards per rush minus what they give up yards per rush against Chicago, is a full three yards favoring Jacksonville. They're plus 1.9 and Chicago is minus 1.1. What do you do in a game like this? You sit back, you watch, and you get the fish and chips out and pass and watch the London football game. All right, Mark. With five seconds to spare. That's a professional. Of course, Mark is going to get it within uh, 60 seconds. He's the man. All right. Just in time, Jim has uh, popped back. Can, can we hear you, Jim? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. So I got to hook you up first, though, Jim. I tell you what, while I hook Jim up... Um, Well, nobody can hear you right now, Jim. You got to wait for me to hook you up. No, we can hear well, you, I, I but they can't hear you. Can't hear you. No, yeah, the, but the, the audience, audience cannot. Can't hear you That's what until it is. I hook you up. So just wait for that. While I hook him up, I got to ask you guys, and, and this is perfect because it's a college football uh, deal, and that's not Jim's thing this year. But how impressed are, are you guys with uh, the start for Army and Navy? I'd love to see 
both Army and Navy be unbeaten going into the Army-Navy <laughs> game, and the winner of that game ends up getting the group of five slot in the college football playoff. We can only but it's dream. not going to happen. We know that. <laughs> no, but I'd like to see it. <laughs> you know, my concern is this, is they both gotten off the great starts, but there are holes on both football teams, and I don't think people see this. And it's, again, from my midweek alert statistical newsletter. And you take a look at Navy. They've allowed season high yards to two of their opponents this year. Army's done the same thing uh, to one opponent this football season. So eventually, the defenses are going to creep up and end up biting these teams. But it's sure fun watching this undefeated season unfold for both of these teams. Uh, I, I think, think I think they've got, got a shot for that, for that game, game to be the uh, – at least one, one of them will play spoiler, and the other one will be undefeated. because They both have Notre Dame. They'll both be underdogs against Notre Dame. One of them pulls an upset against Notre Dame, then the other uh, basically goes for the Commander-in-Chief's trophy because Air Force is garbage this season and uh, can spoil a perfect season for the other rivals. So I, I slightly lean to Navy because I like their offense a little better, but uh, both teams really fun to watch. All right, Jim. So you tell me when you're ready, and we'll go ahead and uh, start the clock. I'm ready, but can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, we're, okay. we're ready. Okay. Well, first of all, the question goes back to the Washington game. I have a parlay for you, in-game but combined parlay, Washington and over in that game. Now, you asked for my one-minute thing. I, I'm not going to need one minute. The Chargers and the Broncos under the total. Two good coaches, conservative play calling. I don't see any offense from either side. It's it's going to be hard to put points on the board. And the defense for, for Denver has been remarkable. And the Chargers don't have that many offensive tools, even though they have to buy extra prep, preparation. I like the under there. All right. So I guess we won't really classify that as a short, but it is a pick. And I, well, I, you had to give me extra time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they have let a 30-second short. So. Let me just let, add a little something to, uh, uh, to that game because the statistics are, are pretty remarkable when you take a look at what these teams, where they rank offensively and where they rank defensively. Uh, I believe one is 28 and one is 29 offensively in yards per game, and I think defensively, I think one is number three and one is number five. So you've got an inefficient offense going up against an outstanding defense, and that applies both ways. All right. Uh, we're going to wrap things up uh, with – before I get into the coffee, because the, the uh, coffee club uh, emails, Mark, uh, why don't you uh, tell our viewers a little bit about it, because uh, this is where I'm able to take – uh, some really good information about, from the emails that come into your uh, email box first thing in the morning. And there's always some really cool uh, tidbits, uh, stories, uh, uh, and all sorts of trends and stats uh, for uh, the fans that, you know, may, they may not get it like one day, but out of, out of you know, when you're talking about an entire week's worth of information, you're always going to find it, some information that's really going to be cool. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, it's our coffee club. It's highly popular right now. It's a free bonus, a no-charge bonus to anybody that subscribes to any of our publications or any of my services. You'll get it each day through the Super Bowl with your subscription, and it comes into your e-box every morning at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uh, some really good stuff in there, and uh, some of the things that we like to do is share not only unique stats, but quotes, and I love quotes. And uh, I'm going to share this uh, on our show here, one of the quotes that we used in the uh, I got a really, really good response to this. It was in one of our write-ups, a guy named Dave Lamont does a lot of our college football write-ups, and he used a great line this particular week, uh, and he was talking about the Jacksonville State, New Mexico State game, and talking about how the Gamecocks, they've been favored by double digits only two times since they joined the FBS, and they won both of those games by 39 points. And he closed it out by saying, uh, there was a quote in the, in the thing, he said, we may not be idiots, Sir, but the one thing one thing we are are idiots. <laughs> so keep that in mind when it comes to handicapping. Sometimes things look a little complex and it looks like confusing and what is this all about? But there's a rhyme and a reason to everything, and I think you're gonna like the rhyme and the reason inside the coffee club. You know, uh, speaking of uh, you know having And I believe they won by forty one last night. <laughs> yes. Shout, Shout out to the Gamecocks for giving me a wise guys win. Uh, early Wednesday, got that in. There you go. 
Uh, you know, it is interesting. It's an interesting perspective because I'm, I got to I got to believe that none of you guys have ever experienced what I did, especially since you're the professionals. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but have you ever been in a situation where in, 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 in during uh, uh, the football season where you really haven't had any focus at all whatsoever for a couple of weeks? Because I just find it interesting. I have no idea whether or not it's going to be a bonus for me taking a look at the games this week. But it just seems to me where you, you know, I don't know. I guess when you when you get so focused on anything in life and it, and it takes it away from you when you come back, your your perspective changes a little bit. Sure. And it and it changes. And I would think for the for the better, where you don't, you know, you, all of a sudden you start looking at things. Well, yeah, that like maybe a little bit clearer. So I don't know if you guys have ever experienced anything like that. Well, when you talk about your situation, most of us we remember what we saw last. But usually last is within the last five or six days. For you, Greg, what you saw last was two or three weeks ago. So any preconceived biases that you may have had if you were looking at it the following week, too much time has passed and you start to be a little bit more objective when you go back and you take a look at things as opposed to over... Well, I've always said that, yeah, you don't want to overreact to what you saw last week, but you don't want to fail to react either because every result has some sort of significance. The amount of you, probably can, on that. you probably can accomplish the same thing by just drinking extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to speak for Jim, but you mentioned about the uh, last five or six days. You remember what you, you saw the last five or six days. For me, it's what I saw the last five or six minutes ago. That's what, what I'll remember. I don't know about Jim, but that's what I remember five or six minutes ago. <laughs> it, it's, it's probably tougher for football, but I, you know, you, there are built-in breaks in, in the NBA and MLB seasons. And then if you take a break on, on that, it's like, who picks up uh, best? So, so I, I would, would just say, say to you, you, you know, trust your gut, gut obviously. obviously. Make sure you have the injury report because <laughs> yeah. that foremost will get you what you need. And then, yeah, just uh, bottom line, the football changes from week to week as it is. So I think you'll, you'll be just fine. One of the things that I noticed when I was I'm just zooming through YouTube yesterday, I had all the library of all the games, and I'm just I, – obviously I can't watch a game. So I'm just running through almost every significant game that I thought was interesting – just to see, hey, is it a close game? Let me watch it. So I did watch as much as I could. But one of the things I noticed, and I know there were a ton of upsets last week, but there, I just noticed how predictable the hangover games were. You know, like Miami struggling to beat Virginia Tech and then almost losing again the next week having to go out west. Or Alabama, Alabama struggling against Vanderbilt after the... There's so many of those things that just like were, wow, I mean, yeah, this, this made sense, right? I mean, even though the Alabama Vanderbilt thing was just something that we've never seen before. So I think it's a huge part of a handicap, Greg, is the hangover angle. And, you know, sometimes you want to embellish it uh, because you, you sense something's there and you want to go out and make your case and make it strongly. But you have to take it for what it is, really, because they're only kids. The college football players are only kids and they're going to react to what they just did. And if they pull upsets in the in the uh, same vein, much like Vanderbilt did to Alabama, uh, there's going to be uh, there's going to be some sort of a reaction to a football game like that. So really, it's an important part of a handicap. Well, that's why, Mark, I was going to ask you the question if you somehow do it in your database. Look aheads and uh, letdowns. I've always felt letdowns occur much more often because it's more recent. Not only that, it prevents you from looking ahead the way you should to the next game. But nonetheless, I think players get more caught up in what they've just done in, as opposed to, oh, we've got to worry about our game next week. Like, for example, you, you talked about Texas against Georgia. Uh, I think that Texas will start thinking about Georgia win or lose after the game against Oklahoma. Right now they're focused on Oklahoma. As opposed to if uh, Texas ends up upsetting Georgia, or maybe we'll see it this week with, uh, uh, with Vanderbilt against uh, Kentucky that they've probably been hearing all week about, uh, uh, you know, after they uh, uh, played Alabama. And now they go down to Kentucky, and Kentucky's been focusing on Alabama, whereas Vanderbilt's been vo focused on, hey, we're a pretty good football team now. Well, Wait, actually, let me, let me throw the old... same question back at Victor uh, with regard to handicapping totals about uh, letdown type situations. You know, uh, as to whether or whether or not they do occur. Does it work that way in the world of NFL totals, Victor? It does. When you see teams coming off uh, either multiple overs, multiple unders in a row, there is generally value fading those teams going in the opposite direction uh, in their next game. A tough thing for the knee-jerk betters to react to because, again, all they're seeing, all they're hearing 
is their most recent memories, and that's last week's games. But you know, you, generally, you consider, generally speaking, would you consider when, three oh, games oh, as, when the, as, when, as before the analytics started, and we we simply used look aheads, let down, stuff like that. And you go to a narrative, like for example, a couple of weeks ago, Seattle played at Detroit. It was a really high scoring game, lots up and back and forth. And and that was, that they had to travel to, from Seattle to Detroit, tough game, go home and host the Giants. And the Giants came in there and played well enough to win the game straight up. But then, then you look at that, then Seattle has to host San Francisco. So look at the situation. Now I know back in the day before the analytics and statistical based stuff, that's how we had the handicap. We had to look at the narratives that went along with what's going on in these guys' heads. We, a lot of the younger people have come into the game with the narratives and the statistics and the analytics and all that. So now we've mixed it all together. So, but it's it, the old ways of looking at narratives and how people think and you know, react to emotions still work. Yeah, matter of fact, Vandy is coming off the upset win, but Kentucky's coming off the upset win. But right. the bonus Kentucky has is is they're coming bye week. off a of bye. But you do wonder though, is that is that really a bonus for them? Because yes. they get an extra week to hang out, mm-hmm. to be the big man on campus. Read to, the press clippings. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that probably took care of that first week. And by the time they got onto Monday's practice this week, okay, they've had all the accolades. Now they're focusing even more than they would have normally on a team like Vanderbilt because of what Vanderbilt did last week. So I actually think it's even more of a positive than it uh, might otherwise have uh, have been uh, without without Van. If Vanderbilt had lost to Alabama like expected, I could see it happening a little bit more because I don't know that Kentucky would take Vanderbilt any more seriously than they now would. So that's where I think the buy comes in and sort of divides the two. The letdown ends. The look ahead, or the it's no, it's no longer a look ahead. It's a preparation. Are you guys surprised, by the way, uh, before I move on to the uh, segment, that the line is actually what it is? Uh, do you think the Vanderbilt's getting a little disrespected, or nah? I mean, it's still Vanderbilt. Okay, Kentucky, remember, lost by a point to Georgia. Much Georgia. higher than I thought it would be, or it should be. Okay. Would you think it was going to be a touchdown? Ten. Uh, I think I think I put nine and a half. It's uh, around here somewhere. Okay. And keep in mind, Alabama was just coming off of that war with uh, Georgia the week before that they nearly lost after having a 30 to seven halftime lead. They actually fell behind on that one yeah. long play, and they answered it right back with the next uh, play. So a lot was taken out both emotionally and physically by Georgia in that game against Alabama. And Vanderbilt's win was no fluke to the extent that they basically led, to, you know, whistle to gun. Yeah. Uh, I, I- Tony. I wrote somewhere, I mean, Diego Pavi has been coming off of uh, <laughs> win, unexpected wins for years now because, I mean, from New Mexico State to Van. So if there's anybody that's going to guard against the hangover letdown game, it's him. Jerry Tony, Kill. Tony, was he with New Mexico State in their 10 win season? Jerry Kill. Yeah. Well, what yeah. was that? It was Kill, Kill and Pavia. Yeah, yeah, it was Pavia and Kill. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, by the way, you guys know what karma is, right? Spelled with a K. Yeah. K-H-A-R-M-A. It's, it's a bitch, right? Yeah. yeah. When I saw what the goes news... Ra- it's what goes around comes around, basically. When I saw the news about Rasheed Rice... Oh, oh that's sad. Mm. Oh. I mean... He, he, oh. yeah, it, sounds like he, it sounds like he actually might beat this injury, though. They're, they're saying it, it's, it's, it's not as... Uh, it's not an MCL or ACL. Well, either way... You know what? It, it, in my opinion, it's good for him. Let him sit. Let him start to r- realize a little bit more about uh, what he did. Uh, I don't want to pick on Greg, but nobody has mentioned anything about the Jets. And we all know how much Greg loves the Jets. Well, I tell you what. Well, he had it, to make one comment. <laughs> not one. I almost they made fi- it. They finally announced they took uh, play calling away from uh, Nathaniel Hackett that. today. Right. You know the interesting thing is is that I'm I'm, I'm without internet for uh, whatever uh, almost two weeks. Internet guy comes over, fixes it, says, "All right, go ahead and uh, and uh, you know he puts it in, in the computer to fix it." And he goes, "Well, go ahead and see if it's working. Turn it on, 
you know, I go right to YouTube, see if it goes up, boop, pops up, and it pops up, you know, on my channel, which has all my favorite stuff. The very first thing that I see <laughs> is fired Robert Sala. And I was waiting for two weeks, not knowing anything. I didn't know the scores of the games. I didn't know if they had won or lost both games. And I was going to sit down and watch these games. And then that's what I saw. And I already knew exactly what happened the last two weeks. But I thought it was interesting because people started saying things like unexpected, blindsided. And, and maybe this has to do with the fact that they watched the games and they were close games. But for me, not having anything to do with what happened the last two weeks, it, how can he be blindsided? Of, of course, they've lost the last two games. They lost to the Denver Broncos. They're supposed to be better than this. Why should this be a blindsided situation? So I thought that was also an interesting take that when you're not – with it when you're not watching the games and, and realizing maybe that they could have won both games they were close but from my perspective of course he got fired well, what's what's the big surprise you know what along those same lines if jacksonville loses both games in london does doug peterson come back on the plane that's a good point yeah he'll come back on a plane but not maybe not the same one might not yes, be the same plane. Yeah. I remember when Greg got his internet service back, he said, he texted me, he says, I finally got my internet service back. I have no clue of what happened at all this weekend. Was there anything interesting? And I texted back <laughs> and I said, the Jets fired Robert Sala. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matter of fact, the first weekend you told me was the, uh, the Alabama-Georgia game. That was the only game, one of four games I knew about the score, was when you told me about what happened in that game. And I still haven't watched it yet. But. Well, Greg, I'm only glad that when you turned your TV on when the internet guy was there, and the first thing that popped up was about the New York Jets, and it wasn't Debbie Does Dallas. It might have been, <laughs> it might have been a little bit embarrassing. I don't know. With a week without internet or so, who knows? Well, then again, a week without the internet, you know, what else is there to do? All right. Uh, speaking of Vanderbilt, here's a quote of the day uh, from one of the uh, coffee club emails. The only place you play in the SEC that's not hard to play is Vanderbilt. It's no disrespect to them. It's just the truth. This was a quote from Nick Saban, uh, and this was on the Saturday ESPN game day show. And uh, I'm assuming, of course, that was the game day of the day where Alabama lost to Vanderbilt. Now, I, what I got to say about that, though, is... is of course, Nick Saban is going to say something like that, but you got to figure a couple things. First of all, what I mean by this is, is that, I mean, DeBoer, not that he probably cared, because even if you heard about this, I mean, it's still Vanderbilt. He's not going to probably feel affected by it, but you got to think, why would you say something like that? Why would you give Vanderbilt more bulletin board material before the game? Again, not thinking that Vanderbilt's a team that should probably upset Alabama. I get that. But I just think that's kind of, I don't know. I mean, you know, Nick Saban's like giving it to DeBoer by saying something like that on game day. Well, they would have had to put that in the locker room on tape right away. Right. Because yep. they, they got <laughs> on just before kickoff, right. They got on the jumbotron in the fourth quarter. But I just Gabby, wonder how many times. To is, is call Saban out on it. Hey, I'm going to make a phone call first thing Monday morning. Hey, Nick, what, what are you thinking there? Think, uh, I'm just wondering how many times Saban and Alabama actually visited Vanderbilt while he was coach. That's true. I don't think it was that many. That to know how bad it was. At least six times, six to eight times. I don't think they play every year. They might not. They the you know, yeah. there for almost twenty. Uh, and then uh, from the sports chat with Mark section, Johnny from Columbus wanted to know: a short while back, you called out the fact that NFL underdogs of more than five points were money in the bank in the NFL this season. How are they presently doing? And Mark responded. Mark, by the way, Mark, would you like to respond, or do you want me to say well, what Vic, you said? Victor, Victor replied to that. Oh, that was I, Victor. I replied in the in the coffee club, but Victor updated us on the show here. What did you say, nineteen, 19 and two, two Victor? Victor? Yeah, nineteen, 19 two, two and one ATS. Right, yes. And again, that depends on what line you use to input your database. We use the closing line of a game. Even that is not a definitive number. So I'm seeing some like 16 and threes ATS still in our database. We've got it 19 and two, still outstanding, right? Yeah, and uh, this was now was this 
last week or was it this week? Because let's see, this I think it was this week. This is they're currently seventeen two and one, winning eleven right, that was, twenty. That was prior to last week's results, which went two and zero. Oh. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, because you had Arizona and the Giants in here, and they both won. All right. And by the way, there's also a stat of the day that we already talked about, which was, well, we kind of talked about it. The stat of the day was zero. Just 12 unbeaten FBS teams remain. We talked about the Army-Navy being the first time that they were combined 10-0 and since the 1940s. I believe it might have been 1945. Five. Um, but the other unbeaten teams, Iowa State, our Cyclones, Mark, Iowa State. First time since 1980. Uh, tough one, tough one this week for them against on the road against West Virginia, big yep, time. Yep. Uh, Indiana. Uh, we talked about them in the beginning of the season. The coaching change, and uh, you just gotta love it. That's awesome for them. Six and zero for the first time since 1967 in Pittsburgh, as uh, Andy alluded to. Five and zero for the first time since 1991. <laughs> So I've got it's, to inter- it's interesting because so far at this point, point for what it's he's interesting done. because I believe that Pitt and Miami do not play each other unless, but they could be in the undefeated reaching the ACC championship game, and I think that's also true of um, who is it Iowa State and um, someone else I think or one of the one of the other Utah teams like that, or, or Kansas State or one of those teams. No, I, no, the other one I think was Army. Well, Army Navy will play each other, but I think there was another one that Baylor and. Uh, one of the other teams, I think, in the Big 12 is still unbeaten. Well, not Baylor, but yeah. Um, well, Utah, right? Oh, uh, that's right. They just lost well, Arizona. BYU. 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 Yeah, that's yeah. BYU. They, BYU. They don't meet in the regular season, so they could theoretically meet unbeaten in the conference championship games. We, we, got, a lot of, we got a lot of alerts, guys, with the hurricane warnings uh, that just came across here with tornadoes and everything and so forth and whatnot. But if I had to put an alert warning out there on this particular issue, edition of the podcast, it would be this. It would be that this is five and all fat cat weekend. And we allude to this in our smart box inside the playbook newsletter. And basically what it amounts to is teams that start out five and all in the season and they lay points in game six, do not come home with the money. Uh, it's really, really a solid play against on the other side of the coin teams that start out five and all and they're disrespected by the odds maker and they're the underdog. They cash those tickets. So, before you're diving knee deep into this weekend's car, check out the teams that are five and zero, and whether they're favorite or. By, whether by the way, I want to just follow up on what Greg was saying. There are now 12 unbeaten teams. Last week there were 19. Seven of them went down, including three in the ACC with Arkansas, Tennessee, and uh, Missouri. Yep. Yeah, you have to wonder too. Is and I'm not saying that this is this is definitely part of it because I think it really is more to do with uh, transfers and so forth. Uh, just the fact that, hey, you know, we don't have to go undefeated anymore. We could lose a couple of games, win our conference. These games aren't as important as they used to be. But whatever the case may be, I, it's obviously great for college football. I mean, just watching these teams get upset the way that they did last week, you just wonder whether or not this is going to continue. And I think it will. Don't you guys think that this is going to be more of the norm, uh, yeah. especially when you've got teams like like conferences like the SEC bringing in Texas, Oklahoma, then they have to play each other. And we've talked about this same thing with the Big Ten. And we, I mean, we did allude to this before the season began, and it's actually happening. I think you mentioned it earlier, Greg, about uh, what well, was it the SEC where there's a big game. I forget what the teams this week, but they both have one loss, and so the loser is in in effect eliminated from making the college football playoff with two losses because there'll be enough one-loss teams out there to fill up. You know, most people think the uh, SEC will get three, possibly four, but let's say three. But there are going to be a number of teams that will be vying for that third and fourth spot. Yeah, the SEC is probably, believe it or not, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the SEC had more than three. And, 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 and we've gone over our rankings. Uh, and, and how many do we have normally? I think about like five, right? We have like five well, how many are How many are in the top 12 right now for, out of the SEC? Well, let's see. You, you know? got six. Yeah, you got Texas, six Alabama, Georgia. Um, Tennessee. Tennessee. Ole Miss. Ole Miss. Ole Miss. Ole Miss. Ole Miss. A&M or Missouri. I mean, they're then you not got the top A&M. 12. Yeah, the other teams to consider, like you said, A&M. You got, what about Kentucky? You know, yep. so... Wow. Yeah, that's a loaded conference. And uh, by the way, uh, before I wrap it up with uh, and send it over to, to Mark to wrap it up, does anybody I'm going to I'll give you I'll give you my quick uh, uh, take here. But does anybody want to give a quick take on the Oregon Ohio State game? Because I will 
because I am not, uh, uh, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a professional like you guys, and I'm not selling picks. But I am going with Ohio State. I think they're going to get revenge after what happened a few years ago when Oregon came to Ohio State and beat them. And I just think uh, Ohio State's been practicing and, and getting ready for this game the entire season. And I think they're going to uh, beat Oregon. So. I think it's a good, good game, and both, think, both teams will play hard. And I've, got to, I've actually got to run, so I'll use this opportunity to, to say goodbye to our audience and to all you guys. Hope, have, hope you have a oh, fantastic weekend, and I'll catch up with you next week. Hey, thanks for your time, Tony. We'll look forward to catching thanks, up with you next week as well. My comment on that game there, Greg, I'll make this short and sweet, is this. I just alluded to 5-0 and fat cats, 5-0 and fat cat dogs. That's a combination of 2-1 and one right there, Oregon being the dog and Ohio State being the favorite. Uh, and I wouldn't step in front of that for sure. And I know that revenge is a factor there, but the coach wasn't there, the players weren't there, sure. so forth and whatnot. So that's my comment on the game. I, I see some contrast there because it is a road trip for Ohio State uh, going out west for the first time. On the other end, I think Ohio State has played uh, better football this year. Maybe Iowa was their biggest test, and they won that easily. Oregon, you know, they forget the game against Idaho, although uh, they should have won a lot easier just because it was Idaho and it was at home. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the great game that Boise State played, and Boise State still, you know, they got a Heisman Trophy uh, uh, top five candidate in there right now. Boise State does, and uh, uh, you know they played a three-point game at uh, at Oregon. You know, a lot of people. I you know I I thought that Brian Day made a great move when he got Chip Kelly to come over as offensive coordinator uh, for the Buckeyes, and I think that they have played the better football. And I'm not quite so sure, even though they did beat them a couple of years ago. If just in general, looking at these Pac-12 teams. If they are up to the physical standard, the physical capability that you see week in and week out in the Big Ten, yeah, there are some of the uh, uh, teams uh, that uh, uh, go out there. But I mean, look at what Indiana did uh, to uh, uh, UCLA. We'll see a little bit more this week with Penn, with Penn State. Same thing with UCLA. We'll see a little bit more this weekend also. Penn State, Big Ten, uh, SC, the, uh, the the Pac-12 team that may not be uh, may not be as physically capable. One other word here, guys, before I put the wraps in the show here, is that uh, uh, there's an intrigue in the game that uh, was involved in the Mississippi game against Kentucky and it took Mississippi down, and there's been other teams that way because the opening month of the season pairs all these Power Four conferences against these these uh, cream puffs, if you will. And uh, we alluded to it, and we called that playing a ramen noodle schedule. And you look at the Ohio State schedule here, they qualify as having played a ramen noodle schedule. Now they're going to have to step up here against a big boy, and we'll see exactly how they how they share fare out in this football game. All right, so uh, that wraps up our segment, our coffee uh, club segment. And uh, again, as Mark uh, mentioned before, I was going to just say one one thing, Greg. Mark, do you remember? In fact, you probably have it in the playbook. Was Oregon maybe like a one point favorite over the summer in this spot against Ohio State? You know, I don't recall that. Honestly, Andy, uh, I don't know what whether they were or they weren't. I couldn't say. I could, the NFL teams, I could tell you, but not the college football. We don't, uh, yeah. you know, I, I don't really keep a gauge on that per se. I know, I know Ohio State was not that big of a road favorite if they were a road favorite. I don't if think they, they were at all, right, before. exactly. They might, is, they, maybe they were one-point favorite, if that, but I thought, I thought Oregon might be favored. And by the way, this is definitely a bigger game for Oregon because Ohio State would be on the road, and if it's a close game – then nobody's going to care that Ohio State lost that game. They're still going to be able to go to the playoffs if, if they have a good rest of the season. But Oregon, if they lose, they're at home. They've already kind of had a wishy-washy start to the season. They may have to run the table if, uh, if they lose the game. And they have to run it in the Big Ten Conference, too, which is yeah. a lot more difficult for sure. Okay, guys, we're going to put the wraps on this show. Uh, for our panel of experts, Andy Isco in Las Vegas, Jim Feist, the legend himself in Las Vegas, Victor King from the Playbook Totals Tip Sheet, Tony Mejia, a Playbook expert, and our producer extraordinaire, Greg De Palma. This is Mark Lawrence, reminding you to always remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always. <laughs>